from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Welcome to Free Expression from the Wall Street Journal editorial page with me, Jerry Baker. In this weekly podcast, I take a deeper look at stories driving the news. If you're not already a subscriber to Free Expression, please do sign up today. We're delighted to have you. This week, we're talking about the nation's politics again, which seem to be in a state of constant flux. And I'm pleased to be joined by one of the newest members of the Republican Party in the country. Misha Maynard, a member of the Georgia State Assembly, quit the Democratic Party just last week, crossing the floor to become a Republican. In the process, she became the first female black member of the GOP in Georgia's legislature. She switched parties, she said, because for too long the Democrats have gotten away with using and abusing the black community. She quote, for decades, she said, the Democratic Party has received the support of more than 90 percent of the black community. And what do we have to show for it? It was not a political decision for me. It was a moral one, she said. Now, of course, vast majority of black voters continue to support Democrats. But her conversion comes amid signs of a steady shift in allegiance as more and more minority voters ask the same questions that Representative Maynard did about what their support for the Democrats has actually achieved. And Misha Maynard joins me now. Misha, thanks very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Thank you, Jerry, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Tell us, first of all, about your decision to leave the Democratic Party. Has this been in the works for a while or did you have a sudden conversion? I would not call it sudden, but like many African-Americans, we are born into being a Democrat without really understanding what that means. We just know we're Democrats and we just know we're supposed to go and vote. So it was not until becoming a legislator, digging into the policy, reading the fine details, that I realized there was a lot of malalignment, which is why I was having such contention between myself and my former colleagues. That led me to think several times, what is the disconnect? (laughs) And here recently, it just came to a head where I said, well, you know what, maybe I'm just not a Democrat because they do not have the same values that I have or that my community members have. Now, it came to a head, particularly recently, I think, on the issue of school choice. There was uh, legislation in the Georgia Assembly, which I think in the end was defeated. But you were the only Democrat, I think, to support a Republican-backed bill for school choice, vouchers, whatever you want to call it. Tell us about that and what you led you to be the only Democrat supporting that. Well, Jerry, I am from an area of the west side of Atlanta. And For those that are local, it's an area called the Bluff, which is crime infested. It's known for crack cocaine. There was actually a movie called The Bluff about it. My mom sent me to another school outside of the district because of the school's failing in that community. Because I had a chance at an education, I think all children should have a chance. You know, I went on to graduate with my master's degree from Howard University. I'm getting my doctorate right now from North Central University. And the people that I represent, one half of my district, the schools are failing. 2% are meeting math proficiency. 3% are meeting reading proficiency. We are in an era of chat GPT. Goldman Sachs has reported 300 million jobs are going to be lost to AI. And where does that leave half of my constituents in dire straits? So that's why I support school choice. You said, I think, in the course of the debate, and you've been very critical of the teachers unions, not necessarily teachers themselves, but teachers unions. So those numbers you quote are astonishing, but they're repeated across the country in so many, particularly urban areas. And it does tragically, particularly affect ethnic minorities, particularly African-Americans. What's going wrong in the schools, do you think? Well, as a legislator, I will say that it does not have to be that way. Who makes the curriculums for urban communities? It's the school board. It's actually not a state initiative. So the school boards, the local superintendents, they have the capacity. If they're using a curriculum that's not working, they have the ability to change that curriculum. So instead of changing the curriculum, they are choosing to stick with something that's not working. Everybody knows the definition of insanity is to keep doing something that isn't working. And they're backing the teachers unions. The teachers unions have not made one single suggestion of what about use a different curriculum. Maybe how you teach a child in suburban areas is not the same way you teach a child in urban areas or 
in rural areas for that matter. In contrast, the other side of my district, which is has a higher socioeconomic group, which is in the community where my daughter just graduated from high school with a 4.3. Um, with that 4.3, I asked her, are you going to be the valedictorian? And she said, no, mom, I'm like number 34. So one half of the highway kids have 4.3s, 4.5s, 5.0s. They're competing with the world. The kids on the other half of the highway that are not reading at proficiency, they're competing with no one. There is no competition. So what you'd like to do, like, you know, and again, obviously one of the reasons you've joined the Republican Party is because this is a core conservative idea, is to give those kids who lack those opportunities because they're stuck in this terrible school system an opportunity to escape that and achieve the same level of educational attainment as those kids like your daughter on the other side of the highway, as you put it. Exactly. It actually makes no sense for the Democrats to want to stifle any child. And I'm glad that you made the correction that it's not that I'm against teachers. I support teachers 100%. Where would we be without teachers? I supported the $7,000 pay raise that we gave teachers, but teachers are stuck too. They are just as shackled to a failing system as the children are. So to say that it's okay to continue to suppress and oppress urban minority children at the cost of supporting a bureaucracy of a teacher's union is just not acceptable to me. The Democrats actually did a poll of all Georgia voters and overwhelmingly, Georgia Democrat voters said, we support parent choice. And instead of them supporting it, they said, well, let's rename it and call it something else. So what do they call it? <laughs> they haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So they think choice may be too appealing to people. So they want to find an alternative way of describing it. Yes. What you say will resonate with so many people. Listeners, so many people, and you've been speaking a lot in the last week about these issues. What about your voters in your district? It's overwhelmingly Democratic, obviously. It voted, I think, more than 70% for Joe Biden in the 2020 presidential election. As you say, so many people support issues, and I want to talk about some of the other issues you're concerned about too, like crime. But why is it, you think? Why are you, in a sense, if I may ask, unusual about this? I mean, there are so many people who must see the same things that you're seeing, this failure of, particularly of sort of Democratic policies of teachers' unions, of public schools, despite the amount of extraordinary amounts of money that's spent on them. Why do you think more people don't actually start to think like you and think, you know, maybe there's an alternative here? Jerry, my district has the most charter schools in Georgia than any other district in the entire state. That is because those residents want other options. So charter schools is the only option that they have. No one wants to send their child to a school where the outcome is dismal. I did a bill last year that did not go anywhere. I'll push it again this upcoming year. When you think about the local school boards and you think about the superintendents, they essentially are running the schools. It's not the state. It's the locals that are running the school. The problem, though, is I mentioned how on one half of the highway, those schools are flourishing. Well, they have school board district members that are also in their higher socioeconomic status, right? So members of the school board are business owners. They may be professionals of some sort versus the local school board members in lower socioeconomic statuses. We just had one that was a bodyguard. He was trying to be a rapper. That was who was responsible for a $1.5 billion budget for children. So. My legislation said, you know what, for these lower socioeconomic communities, they need more training. The school board members need more training on accountability, on their fiscal fiduciary responsibility. They need business planning. They just need so much more because they're coming to the table, not with the resources to really help the students. That was shot down. And you know who it was shot down by? It was shot down by the locals. <laughs> the local school boards don't want anyone to control them. The superintendents don't want anyone to control them. I'm also thinking about doing some legislation which makes superintendents an elected position, 
because if we have school board members that are choosing friends to be superintendents, that's also another issue. We're going to take a break there. When we come back, I'll have more with Misha Mena, who's the newly Republican member of the Georgia legislature. We're going to be talking about what her decision to leave the Democratic Party and join the Republican Party, what national implications that may have and the way in which American politics may be changing in this direction. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. Welcome back. I'm talking with Misha Maynard, who last week left the Democratic Party, joined the Republican Party in the Georgia legislature. And we're talking about race and politics in America. Some of the other issues, too, that obviously that have concerned you. One issue I know has been crime, which has obviously been a significant problem in many parts of the country over the last few years in particular. And in particular, I know you, again, were quite exceptional in Democrats in the Georgia legislature in uh, supporting a measure, I think, by the Republicans, essentially, which would stop local municipalities from defunding the police. Tell us about that and tell us more broadly how that fits into your view about dealing with crime, how many African-Americans, particularly disadvantaged ones, deal with crime, and the way the Democratic Party views that issue? So I'm going to answer that with two bills in mind. I voted not to defund the police last year, and this year we had a prosecutor oversight bill, which I also supported. Both bills were not supported by Democrats. I'm the victim of stalking. And as a victim of stalking, I have called the police and the police have not shown up. I am not the only person where the police have not shown up. There was a child in Midtown Atlanta called the police. The police never showed up. She was attacked in a Midtown high rise apartment. So the first thing I said with the defund the police, we don't need to give the police a reason not to show up. So they're funded. It's no reason they should not be showing up, right? The second piece to that is many people in my community were calling me saying, we do not want to defund (laughs) the police. Crime is too bad in our communities. And it didn't matter if it was a low socioeconomic neighborhood or a high socioeconomic neighborhood. There was crime on both sides. For the prosecutor oversight bill, the Democrats tried to say that this was a bill about Fannie Willis prosecuting Donald Trump. That was marketing propaganda, another way that they mislead Black Americans. That's another reason why I switched, because I don't like how they mislead people. They intentionally and purposely lie to Black people that are not digging into the details of the bill for their own personal gain. But back to the prosecutor oversight bill. Yeah. That was the very first bill that I signed on to in 2021 before there was any mention of any indictment against President Trump. This was not a bill about the DA in Fulton County. So your concern and other legislators' concerns about crime and about making sure that prosecution was being pursued, is that what it was about? Yes. So there are many different examples. So the sponsors of the bill, there were prosecutors that once they were elected, they said, these are a list of crimes that I refuse to prosecute. Since when can the prosecutor decide They're just not going to follow the law, right? I mean, a crime is a crime. And in some of those instances, they were motor vehicle incidences and people died as a result later because prosecutors did not prosecute people that were having these traffic offenses. What I stood on the House floor and talked about were families that were lost children to police violence. I support law enforcement. Everybody, I think, is pretty comfortable saying we do have some rogue police officers out there. There are multiple families that came to me and said, hey, our loved ones were lost to police violence and prosecutors are refusing to prosecute. 
So I dedicated my vote to those families. I see. So that was because of those particular instances. But the broader phenomenon we've seen of prosecutors saying they're not going to prosecute whole categories of crime. I live in New York City. We've got a DA who's basically taking that approach here. Many other cities across the country are. That presumably, again, because crime so disproportionately affects minorities and particularly the African-American community. I mean, how do your voters see these issues, these issues about lenient prosecution? Prosecutors, these progressive prosecutors, how do they see that that what we that phenomenon that we've seen in the last few years? No one in my community agrees with that. As a former Democrat, I campaigned on victim rights, which is the prosecutor oversight bill. I campaigned on public safety, which was not defunding the police. I campaigned on parent choice. Every single thing that I campaigned on, my community voted me twice into office without a runoff with multiple people in my race because I supported their concerns. It just so happens none of those concerns are concerns of the Democrats. They are actually in opposition to those ideals. Do you feel the Republican Party on these issues, you know, again, your decision to join the Republican Party will doubtless disappoint many of your Democrats and maybe maybe many people in the African-American community. But what is it about the Republican Party that on these issues that are of importance to you, of, of importance to all Americans, but particular importance to African-Americans, what is it about the Republican Party that appeals to you? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Let me start with saying One, everything that I campaign for is an ideal of the Republican Party. I do not believe either party is perfect. I went into politics as a Democrat. I quickly was labeled a moderate and a centrist. Did not know it was such a thing, but I accepted that position because I did not believe that Democrats got all issues right. The beautiful thing is as a moderate or centrist, you technically can be that as a Republican or a Democrat, right? There were many issues that the Republican Party supported that made sense to the Black community that Democrats often got wrong. And leadership would actually say to me, please just vote with us on this one, quote unquote, give us a bone. And so if things were not too consequential to my community, Even though I agreed with the Republican vote, I went ahead and I voted with the Democrats, even though I did not believe in what they were saying. Another example of a bill that the Democrats hounded me on was a bill, it was 1331, which was a workforce development bill. People in marginalized communities don't have opportunities. And so it was a bill about workforce development. They did not like that bill. So What appeals to me about the Republican Party agenda, they support job growth, they support economic development, they support people having the right to choose what they want, they support public safety, and most importantly, they are not putting up any bills in the Georgia General Assembly that suppresses and oppresses Black Americans. The other thing I will say is The Republicans have all said, look, Representative Maynard, we're not perfect, but what we will do is we won't ostracize you. We won't put thousand dollar checks up against you if you don't vote the way the majority votes. We support you and your independence. We support your community because you are in urban Atlanta. So you have the most distinct district of all Republicans at this moment. Obviously, again, this whole issue of many African-Americans rethinking their allegiance to the Democratic Party is live. And we've, you know, we've got in the Republican presidential primary at the moment, we've got you know, Senator Tim Scott running. We've had some examples, again, of some prominent African-Americans, again, like yourself, switching over to the Republican Party. Former President Barack Obama you know, kind of weighed in on this issue recently and about how Republicans view, shall we say, race and African-Americans. And he says there's a long history of African-American or other minority candidates within the Republican Party who validate Americans, say everything's great and we can make it. But he says that doesn't include a plan to address the crippling generational poverty that's a consequences of hundred years of racism in the society. What's your response 
to that. He says that's a fundamental flaw in the Republican Party, that even though individual African-Americans may, just as you've very, very, very well explained why they may support the Republican Party, that the Republican Party isn't addressing these fundamental issues of racism in the country. It doesn't have any interest in doing so. What is more fundamental than trying to give a child that can't read the ability to? So you think it's important to sort of look beyond the race issue in a way and focus on the real challenges that that people face, particularly African-Americans, but that all people face. You know, Jerry, this is a conversation that will require another podcast. I'll say this. There is race in the world, right? There are different demographics. There are different ethnic groups. There was slavery. There were some agenda items last year that were passed. The Democrats tried to say The Republicans are trying to hide history. If you actually read the legislation, it says, no, talk about slavery, talk about the KKK, talk about anything in history. They just did not want teachers to give a subjective opinion. It's hard to give facts sometimes without giving a subjective opinion. So that was their stance. I think that we are where we are. It's 2023. I think that history is history. It will always be there. But what do we do about right now? What do we do about tomorrow? And what do we do about next week? We cannot move forward unless we are trying to move ourselves forward. We move ourselves forward with K through 12 education. We move ourselves forward with quality workforce development especially in technology and renewable energy in this AI era. Democrats like to talk about the past. That is the only thing that they can talk about, the past. The past, the past, the past. And I am not discrediting the past. It is so important. My children know everything there is to know about the past. One, because I'm a history junkie. But how do we move forward? How do we move forward is the question. It is the question. I couldn't agree more. Just while we're on this topic, can I ask you what you made of the Supreme Court decision a couple of weeks ago on what's called affirmative action or racial preferences in education? Again, you spent a lot of time in education yourself. You went to, you said, a historically black college. You've got a daughter who's obviously doing very well academically. And, you know, this is a big decision which well, should end 50 years of this approach in higher education. What, what was your view of it? I had several views about that. One, I look at it was another minority group that essentially brought the case forward. So Asian Americans, not all, some Asian Americans felt like it did not help them, right, to have these affirmative action policies in place. So that's one thing. There was another minority that had a priority over an African American's priority. I feel like everybody's priority is important, so I don't want to pit one priority over another one. But the second piece to that is if you have children that are have 4.3 GPAs, can speak languages fluently, are well-versed in the world and the economy, they don't need affirmative action. So my daughter did not benefit from affirmative action. Me going to a historically Black college, I did not benefit from affirmative action. I am a pragmatic person. So that means, okay, if there's not affirmative action, what are we going to do? Democrats, what are you going to do? Because you're definitely not concerned about the kids in kindergarten or the eighth grade or graduating from high school that can read. And so, and to that point, if you can't read, you can't benefit from affirmative action because you can't even get into those colleges. So it comes back again to just making sure that, you know, however we do it, and if that requires school choice, uh, as you say, making sure that the kids are equipped with uh, given the education that they need, that's the most important. That's really addressing the problem at the root, isn't it? It is. And look at how many African-Americans really benefit from affirmative action. That number is so small. And so, again, it's a way to get caught up in the weeds because you're distracting from what the problem is. I'm going to ask you another question, which you're probably going to say will take another podcast to answer. But I'll ask you it anyway, because you've obviously thought very deeply about these things. A lot of Democrats like to say, in fact, it's become the kind of mantra, really, of progressive Democrats and indeed of the Democratic Party as a whole, that, that this country is systemically racist. Do you think that's true? And what does it mean if it is? So 
When people say that America has systemic racism and the institutions are systemically racist, I look at the demographics of the country. Let's just say roughly there are 50 percent white Americans in the country, 50 percent minorities of all different sorts. The demographic of the minorities change. Immigration policies have a big factor in the change of the minority demographics. With that being said, there are more white people in America than individual minority groups. Every ethnic group, including white Americans, everybody is looking out for their best interests. I think that's just human nature, right? A Jewish person is going to be more concerned about things that impact the Jewish community. Same for Muslims, same for Blacks, same for a white person in rural Georgia, same person, same thing as a white person in suburban America. With that being said, Dr. King marched because there were things that Black Americans in particular did not have access to housing, access to quality health care, access to quality education. So the civil rights movement was all about fighting for those things. And here we go, 50 years later, we are still fighting for those things. But would we have to really fight for those things if the Black leaders over the past 50 years were doing things differently? I think a lot of the systemic racism if you want to call it that, it's multifold. There are several people that are the cause of the current state of Black Americans, and white Americans are not in elected leadership positions in Black communities. White Americans are not leading the school boards in Black communities. White Americans are not the prosecutors. <laughs> so, the systemic racism can be multifold. You know, there is such a thing as black on black crime. I've seen a little bit of the response you've had since you left the Democratic Party during the Republicans last week. You've had some, um, I think, fair to say, depressing, but perhaps rather predictable, offensive response from some Democrats. Give us a sense of both the good and the bad reactions that you've had to your decision. I think that the Democrat Party wants to be the party of tolerance. They did not tolerate me. While I was in the party, they're not tolerating me when I'm outside of the party. And so I think that they need to stop saying that they're inclusive. They need to stop saying they appreciate diverse thought. I think they need to stop saying all of those things. So the past three years, people just don't know was already so hard. The things that they did to me over the past three years toughened my skin to the point where the things that people are seeing online, that does not phase me one bit. So have you had any reaction from national political figure? I mean, you, again, your story went national. It's a big moment when someone, again, of your background and of your political leanings changes parties like that and receives some attention. Have you had any reaction from Democrats or Republicans nationally? I have not had, uh, I haven't been searching either. So to my knowledge, no National people from the Democrat side have said anything. The leadership in Georgia has not said anything. You know, the Democrats are trying to stay silent. Only thing that they are saying at the local level is, OK, we did treat her bad, but I would not call it a crucifixion. Yeah, because you I think you said you'd been crucified. Is it? Yeah. From the Republican side, I've had several presidential candidates reach out to me. It is 12 candidates. I hope all 12, you know, reach out to me. I hope all 12 come to District 56. That has been so underserved for so many years. I've had Ronna McDaniel from the Republican National Committee reach out to me. Prior to making this announcement, I spoke to Governor Brian Kemp, Speaker John Burns, um, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones, also our Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones, who for a moment was the first female speaker of the House in the state of Georgia after the untimely death of our former Speaker of the House, David Ralston, who I love dearly. So it has been a pleasant response from the Republican side. And they love you. I wouldn't change a thing. I'm not surprised to hear that Republican presidential candidates have reached out to you. You're, as it's presumably you'll now be voting in the presidential primary, not so long, in the Georgia primary next year. 
Do you lean towards any of the candidates right now? You know, I tell people I have been a Republican for two seconds. And so I am getting my bearings and focusing on demonstrating to my community what a Black woman Republican can do for them. Misha Mena, newly Republican member of the Georgia legislature. Thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Thank you, Jerry. I really enjoyed it. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression. We're taking a break next week, so hope you're enjoying your summer and you get a little bit of a break yourselves. And we'll be back in August with more discussions about the big issues that are shaping our world. Please join us then. In the meantime, have a good summer. See you in August. <laughs>